The innovation that we are going to be looking at is an uh, innovative option that's been suggested for the management of arthritis. And as all of you know, that it's becoming an increasing burden in today's day and age. And especially those of you in general practice will agree that the burden of joint pains is becoming a big burden. So what we're going to briefly look at is uh, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, a broad overview of the pathophysiology, the current treatment options and their limitations, and what the role of a novel anti-inflammatory agent would be in this case. So coming first to rheumatoid arthritis, we know that it's a systemic disorder characterized by chronic inflammatory arthritis, and unfortunately we don't know the exact etiology. There's an inflammatory state which involves multiple systems, including the skin, eyes, lungs, and blood vessels, so it's a multi-system disorder. And it has a fluctuating and unfortunately an unpredictable prognosis. And it does have an increased risk of coronary vascular related deaths as well. So it's a complex and multifactorial pathogenesis. But some things we do understand is that one of the basic features is the activation of the macrophages by the antigen presenting cells and the T cells. And this leads to release of inflammatory cytokines namely TNF-alpha and IL-1. And these in turn lead to synovitis, production of collagenase, which destroys the extracellular matrix, and release of MMPs, that's the metal matrix metalloproteases, which leads to cartilage degeneration. So the end result is cartilage degeneration as far as the joint is concerned. Coming to osteoarthritis, you'd think that this has traditionally been formed as an osteoarthrosis and not an arthritis. But again, at a cellular level, we find that TNF-alpha and IL-1 are again responsible because these are found to be increased in osteoarthritis as well. And also, elevated levels of IL-6, interleukin-17, and MMPs are also found in synovial fluid. And all of these, in turn, actually give rise to an inflammatory component in osteoarthritis as well. So TNLF-alpha, that's uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha and IL-1, are the major inflammatory cytokines that are involved in both rheumatoid as well as osteoarthritis. And the release of these inflammatory cytokines is really re regulated by nuclear factor kappa B, or NFKB in short. And this is a transcription factor that's present in all cells. It plays an essential role in inflammatory and immune responses, and it can be called the master switch of inflammation. And disorders due to NFKB activation include rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, and juvenile rheumatoid. So how does this activation actually occur? Basically, if there's an inflammatory stimuli of varying etiology, really, you get the kinase release, which form, releases the, I, the binding and activates the NFKB. And this translocates into the nucleus. There's activation of gene encoding inflammatory mediators, and you get the pro-inflammatory cytokines being released. And this, in turn, gives rise to your inflammatory response. So the outcome of NFKB activation is basically in uh, the relief of these enzymes gives rise to effects on the synovial membrane, which leads to inflammation and proliferation of the synoviocytes, giving rise to the typical panis that we see in rheumatoid arthritis. You get uh, release of chondrocytes or activation as a result of which there is cartilage destruction. And on the bone as well, there's osteoclastogenesis and bone erosions. So these are all the classical symptoms that are associated in rheumatoid arthritis. So NFKB plays a crucial role in the inflammatory and immune responses through the regulation of genes encoding pro-inflammatory cytokines and the inducible enzymes. So what are the current treatment options and what are their limitations? Basically, if we look at rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis, we have N agents that provide symptomatic relief. So what are these? These basically fall into two groups, non-steroidals, and the steroids, which are more commonly used, especially for short duration, in rheumatoid. Non-steroidals, unfortunately, are not suitable, especially in the elderly age group. 
And long-term use can give rise to gastritis, nausea, vomiting, upper GI bleeding, all of which can give rise to a significant amount of morbidity and mortality. Along with that, you get renal toxicity, liver toxicity, and an increased cardiovascular risk with a number of the COX-2 inhibitors as well. Steroids as well, as is well known, has a significant number of side effects. So these are still widely used simply because we do not have anything better at our disposal. So we need an effective yet safe and well-tolerated anti-inflammatory agent. And that is basically the demand that physicians have today. The other option that is available in rheumatoids are agents that actually control disease progression. That includes the DMARDs, that's specifically methotrexate, hydroxyquinoline, and leflunamide. These are unfortunately slow to act, but they do provide a partial response. But unfortunately, uh, with over a period of time, you often find that there is uh, waning in the response. And we do need to monitor most of these drugs with regular blood tests, especially for side effects in the liver as well as in the peripheral blood counts. The biologics are the new kids on the block, so to speak. You've got the anti-TNLF alpha agents such as etanercept, infliximab, then um, rituximab. These are the drugs that are now becoming the rage. But again, they target only a specific inflammatory mediator. You can get injection site reactions. You do get an increased risk of tuberculosis and other bacterial infections. So before you start treatment, you've actually got to screen the patient for tuberculosis. And again, unfortunately, in our um, socioeconomic status, most patients are unable to afford biologics, which are prohibitively expensive. So the need for an innovation was really crying out. And what has actually been proposed is the use of curcumin, which is a biologically active phytochemical compound that's obtained from your common haldi, or curcuma longa. And it possesses diverse chemical uh, properties. It can be used as an anti-inflammatory, an antioxidant, an anti proliferative as well as an anti-angiogenic. And there are over 65 clinical trials with over 1,000 patients completed and uh, over 35 ongoing clinical trials as well. So it is a, a widely studied molecule, and it's a molecule of ongoing interest. And basically, curcumin acts as an NFKB inhibitor. And as we've just seen, it actually controls the master switch of inflammation, basically turning it off. So curcumin actually has a multiple level of action. It inhibits the uh, uh, IKB kinase enzyme. It prevents the activation of NFKB. It prevents the translocation of the activated uh, NFKB into the nucleus and thereby prevents the release of anti -in uh, the inflammatory mediators. So it has an effect on multiple levels of the inflammatory response. Coming to the evidence, what does it say about curcumin? Coming to rheumatoid arthritis, it's been shown that Compared to diclofenac, the disease activity score and the American College of Rheumatology scores are superior as compared to diclofenac. And also, there was a 52% higher reduction in CRP levels, which is an inflammatory marker that we use for monitoring rheumatoid, when curcumin has been used. So curcumin is effective and safe in patients with active rheumatoid arthritis. Similarly, in another pilot study, 18 patients were treated with curcumin for two weeks. It improved joint swelling, morning stiffness, and walking times. And curcumin was very well tolerated and had a better GI tolerability than most non-steroidals. So curcumin is effective and well tolerated. Coming to combination therapy, curcumin, when given along with the COX-2 inhibitor, celecoxib, it decreases the need for celecoxib. Similarly, with prednisolone, it has an additive inflammatory action through inhibition of inflammatory cytokines with a significant reduction in joint swelling and a reduction in side effects due to steroids. Curcumin, when administered with methotrexate, which is another common DMARD, it has a synergistic antiarthritic action and it may actually reduce the, road, the dose of methotrexate that is required for rheumatoid arthritis, thereby reducing the risk of hepatotoxicity, and hematological problems. 
Coming next to osteoarthritis, 820 patients attending outpatient clinics were treated with curcumin for six months, and you can see that there's a significant improvement in the scores. Results, significant improvement in pain, improved joint mobility, and a better quality of life. 50% of patients were able to discontinue their use of non-steroidals and other analgesics. So curcumin therapy was well tolerated, and the curcumin actually relieved the pain and the need for non-steroidals. Again, there was a study with the head-to-head -head with ibuprofen, and it was found that curcumin was effective, as effective as ibuprofen, with a lower incidence of GI side effects. So it's as effective as non-steroidals, but it actually has a better GI tolerability. Now, it's also been tried as a monotherapy in osteoarthritis. In, in this particular study, 100 patients were treated for over a period of eight months, and there was significant decrease in inflammatory biomarkers. That's your IL-1 uh, beta, IL-6, CD-40 ligand, and so on. A 50% decrease in WOMAX score, which is basically an activity or functional score that is used to monitor the treatment of arthritis. And similarly, a threefold increase in the treadmill walking distance. So patients were obviously able to walk for longer periods. In addition, patients already on NSAIDs and, and analgesics, co-administration of curcumin was associated with a decreased use of N no NSAIDs and a marked reduction in GI side effects. So curcumin is effective and safe in the long-term treatment of osteoarthritis. You see here that the patients received it for eight months. Coming to combinations with diclofenac, it also shows this was tried for a period of three months, and patients who received combination treatment had greater pain relief, better improvement in knee injury, and osteoarthritis outcome scores. So again, their scores were better, their functional improvement was also better. So it's a good combination to use even with a non-steroidal. Coming to the safety, curcumin is basically what is GRAS or GRAS, generally re recognized as safe. There's no noticeable adverse effects with doses up to 8 grams for up to 3 months. Unlike non-steroidals, it's free from renal hepatotoxic or cardiovascular side effects even after long-term use. Very occasional patients may complain of mild and transient nausea or diarrhea. So side effects in general tend to be mild. Unlike non-steroidals, steroids and DMARDs, curcumin is generally very well tolerated. Now unfortunately, conventional curcumin is poorly absorbed from the GI tract. It is undetectable in the plasma and it does not reach the target organs. So there's been a question raised as to how efficacious, efficacious it would be. And clinical con trials that were conducted were carried out using conventional curcumin. And in some studies, they had doses of up to 12 grams a day. Few studies have not shown positive results. Few have shown poor GI tolerability. So the need of the R was for a bioavailable, a more effective, and a well-tolerated curcumin formulation. And this has been done by the tech, this tech particular technology, or the SMEDS technology, that's self-micro-emulsifying drug delivery system. And by this system, you have smaller nano-sized particles of curcumin, which have improved absorption, given better tissue penetration, and as a result of which there's increased bioavailability. And this bio-enhanced curcumin has shown to be measurable in the uh, blood at much lower levels. So you can see on the graph on the top that up to 400 milligrams, you can see a significant rise in the curve. And it ensures that you get a much higher bioavailability compared to conventional curcumin. So in summary, curcumin inhibits the master switch of inflammation. It decreases the release of inflammatory prostaglandins and cytokines, which we find in osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. Monotherapy may be effective, is effective and safe in the treatment of both rheumatoid and osteoarthritis. The efficacy is at par with non-steroidals, but with a G better GI tolerability. When given with non-steroidals or steroids, it has an additive or synergistic action. 
it helps in reducing the dose and along with that it can be used with methotrexate which in turn will reduce the hepatotoxicity of methotrexate and unlike, unlike biologics it can be given orally and is safe and well tolerated. So it's a suitable op option not only as monotherapy but also as combination therapy. So it's an attractive option that will hopefully be available soon for the management of rheumatoid arthritis either as monotherapy or combination therapy. It's particularly useful in the following group of patients, especially those who are intolerant to non-steroidals, steroids or DMARDs, patients with compromised renal function, hepatic dysfunction and cardiovascular disorders, especially hypertension and coronary heart failure. So it is effective, safe and well tolerated treatment option and hopefully it will make sure that patients can have their life pain free. Thank you very much.